In part one of this video, we started to answer the nine most important questions about wireless communications for makers. In this video, we will continue and dig more into the matter. If you did not already watch the first part, I strongly suggest clicking on the link in the upper right edge of your display now. Gritty YouTubers, here is the guy with the Swiss accent, with a new episode and fresh ideas around sensors and microcontrollers. In the first part, we talked a lot about the influence of carrier frequency and started to understand the concept of bandwidth. In this video, we will cover the significance of bandwidth on wireless communication, the different modulation principles, methods to increase the reliability of wireless connections, and we will learn which methods were preferred by SPICE. At the end, we will use all our knowledge to compare two well-known modules the NRF24L01 and the RFM69, both representing very different concepts. So let's continue where we stopped in part one. At the task of modulating the carrier frequency with our baseband signal. There are many ways of doing it, all with advantages and disadvantages. For makers, three modulation principles are relevant. Amplitude modulation, frequency modulation and LoRa, which is a combined method. We will not cover it today. Amplitude modulation or AM is the simplest way. It is used since the beginning of radio. Let's start with a carrier frequency of 100 kHz. In the time domain, it looks as expected. Also the frequency domain. The oscilloscope shows frequencies from 90 to 110 kHz. Now we amplitude modulate the carrier with a 1 kHz signal. The time domain looks like that and we see a 100% modulation. In the frequency domain we get two additional peaks at nearly the same amplitude as the carrier, each separated by precisely 1 kHz from the carrier. These are the two sidebands. So the bandwidth of this signal is 2 kHz. If we increase the modulation frequency to 2 kHz, the signal in the time domain looks a little bit different and the bandwidth extends to 4 kHz. We learn the higher the modulation frequency, the broader the bandwidth. The two sidebands look the same. If I reduce the depth of the modulation signal and leave its frequency the same, the sideband peaks get smaller, but the bandwidth stays the same. What happens if we change the modulation to a square wave instead of a sine? As expected, much more sideband peaks start to appear and the bandwidth is much bigger, exactly as we saw before when we looked at the square wave signal in the baseband. By the way, here we see a modulation often used by our devices. OOK or on off keying. OOK is amplitude modulation where we only switch the carrier on or off, like here with the square wave signal. A straightforward way to modulate a carrier. Another modulation quite often used is frequency modulation or FM. In FM we keep the level of the carrier always at the maximum and change its frequency according to the modulation signal. The time domain looks like this. The signal always is at maximum level and the frequency changes are not readily visible. What happens in the frequency domain? The signal looks very different. It has no distinct peaks and generally seems to be broader than with AM. What happens if we use a square wave for modulation? The time domain does not change a lot. Also here, the bandwidth in the frequency domain gets bigger. By the way, this is another modulation frequently used by our devices. FSK or frequency shift keying. The signal is shifted between two frequencies. How do bandwidth and power correlate? Let's assume we have 100 milliwatt for our transmitter. These 100 milliwatts include the power of the whole bandwidth. So the bigger the bandwidth, the more the power is distributed. 
and the signal strength per bandwidth becomes smaller. As we will see later, this reduces the range of our devices. One additional word about bandwidth. The bandwidth of the receiver has to be adjusted to the bandwidth of the transmitted signal. If its bandwidth is smaller, we do not hear the full content. And if it is broader, we receive unnecessary noise and interference from other signals. Both facts lead to a bad performance. These experiments showed that each signal occupies a particular bandwidth. The bandwidth gets bigger the higher the modulation frequencies or the faster the speed of the digital signal. This is a physical law and can only be optimized with some tricks. It cannot be avoided entirely. Why is bandwidth so significant? First, because the receiver only can listen to one device on a particular frequency at the same time. What is the impact of carrier frequency? If our signal, for example, needs a bandwidth of 10 kHz, we only can place one channel between 10 and 20 kHz. But we can place 100,000 channels between 1 and 2 GHz. Second, the higher bandwidth reduces the available link budget and therefore reduces the maximum range of our devices. We always talked about a transmitter and a receiver. What if we need two-way communication? We need a transmitter and a receiver on both ends. These devices usually are called transceivers. And we have two possibilities. Either we use the same frequency for both directions, called simplex, and switch the direction from time to time, or we use different frequencies for both directions. Examples for switching are most devices used by makers. An example of duplex is mobile phones. The last topic is transmission reliability. This is a vast area because radio communications are not as reliable as wired connections because of the two facts we covered before. Interference from other users of the same frequencies and changing propagation if the devices move around. We have three possibilities to deal with these facts. We accept that the channel is unreliable and are happy if it works. This is the principle of the ALOA protocols as used in LoRaWAN. But it can only be used for data which is not very important or does not change a lot over time. You probably would not want to transfer money with this method. Its significant advantage is that it is simple and we need no return channel. It should only be used for good connections and low interference levels. The next better solution is to build some error correction into the transmission. A simple one could be to transmit a message three times in a row and the receiver decides two to one which is the right content. Systems like that are called forward error correction or FEC protocols. Much better protocols were invented and we do no more need to repeat the whole message three times. But one disadvantage remains. We lose throughput because of the required redundancy. I know from first-hand experience that such protocols were used to transmit messages to spies in foreign countries where it was not possible to establish a return channel without being discovered. The last protocol needs a return channel. The transmitter sends a packet to the receiver. This packet includes some code to decide if it was received correctly. The receiver checks each packet and returns either OK or not OK. And the transmitter continues with the next package or repeats the same packet till it arrives without errors. This protocol needs a two-way communication, is very reliable and adapts its speed to the conditions of the channel. On a good channel, you do not lose a lot of throughput. If you encounter a short interference, the throughput will be reduced. As soon as this interference disappears, the channel operates again at full speed. And the transmitter always knows if the content arrived. Much better for transferring money, I think. Summarized, 
To transmit signals in space, we have to modulate them on high-frequency carriers. The frequency used by the carrier dictates the properties of the connection. Low frequencies penetrate obstacles and bend around hills. Higher frequencies behave more like light. And higher frequencies lose much more power over distance. The bandwidth of a signal determines the maximum frequency which can be transferred and therefore the throughput rate. The higher the bandwidth, the higher the available data rate. Higher carrier frequencies offer much more bandwidth than lower frequencies. Only very few frequencies can be used by unlicensed users. They are called ISM bands. Even there we have to use certified equipment. Only licensed radio amateurs are allowed to build their own equipment. The range of a device is heavily influenced by carrier frequency, the maximum bandwidth used by the signals and the available output power. There is always a trade-off between these three factors. Unfortunately, there are no shortcuts available. The only exception is a good antenna. It increases our link budget without reducing bandwidth or increasing transmission power. Most of our devices use simplex communication where communication direction is switched from time to time. Wireless connections by definition are insecure, so we have to encrypt our content if we want privacy. Let's now use our knowledge and look at a typical question. Which module is better? the NRF24L01 at 2.4 GHz or an RFM69 module at 868 or 915 MHz. The scenario I want to communicate across one kilometer. The transmitter and the receiver can see each other. Let's start with a loss in space. On 2.4 GHz we lose roughly 9 dB more power than on 868 which means we need a 10 times stronger transmitter for the same distance. In many cases, this would be illegal and for sure would kill our battery very fast. Next, the bandwidth. The NRF can transmit up to 2 megabits per second, which is extremely fast. For this speed, it needs a bandwidth of nearly 2 megahertz. At lower rates, the bandwidth is smaller. If we look at the receiver datasheet, we see that its sensitivity depends on bandwidth, from minus 94 up to minus 82 dBm. It confirms what we learned. More bandwidth reduces the sensitivity and therefore reduces the available link budget. Because of the reduced link budget and the high losses in space, the chance we can bridge one kilometer with two NRF24L01 modules is meager, even if we use the long-range variant with more power. Here the proof. Charles Allard reached only 80 meters with the standard option, even on the lowest transfer rate. Looking at the RFM69, it operates at 868 MHz and supports speeds from 1.3 up to 300 kilobits per second in FSK and 1.3 to 32 kilobit per second in on-off keying. So the fastest rate of the RFM69 is similar to the slowest rate of the NRF24L01. On the receiver side we see also here, the smaller the bandwidth, the higher the sensitivity. Generally, the RFM69 can detect signals at much lower levels because it uses much smaller transmission speeds and therefore a smaller bandwidth. Unfortunately, there is no sensitivity data available for 300 kilobits to compare. Both use FSK modulation. The NRF uses GFSK, which is a slight modification to optimize bandwidth usage. The RFM69 also offers OOK for compatibility. From my war driving tests, I know that bridging one kilometer in open space is no problem for the RFM69. LoRa uses even lower throughput rates and only a few bits per second, not kilobits. This results in a very narrow bandwidth and extremely long ranges, 
but you cannot transfer more than a few sensor readings on these channels. So neither the NRF24L01, RFM69 or LoRa is better or worse. They are only different. And you have the choice. And this choice, as often in life, has its limits and trade-offs. I want to thank all my supporters on Patreon for supporting the channel. Without you, it would be difficult for me to do what I do now. Bye.